libro que publicamos, que es Alimentarnos con dudas disfrazadas de ciencia, nutriendo conflictos de interés en México. We'll be presenting this book that we published called Fitting Us with Doubt, Disguised as Science, Nourishing Conflicts of Interest in Mexico, a book written by Martelena Garcia and Guillermo Bermúdez. We will be presenting this book by them, by the authors, and then we will have the opportunity to listen to comments from Fernanda Hoppenheim. She is uh, executive co-director of Poder since 2018, an organization focusing on uh, surveillance of corporations and their activity. We thank her for attending, as well as uh, Mr. Manuel Toledo, one of the, well, he's a highly regarded thinker in political economy, not, in, uh, not only in Mexico, but also internationally. I will. Uh, present both of them uh, in a more detailed manner before we start with their comments. I would like to offer a um, few introduction words before we go to the authors. The book by Martelena Garcia and Guillermo Bermúdez is the first book that focuses uh, in the capture of academy science and politics by corporations of that manufacture consumer products. Internationally, this type of work has been developing, especially starting with the interference of the tobacco industry in the research made by this industry and the documents that were made known in the legal proceedings that took place against this industry. More recently, there is a series of documents on the sugar industry and the sugar sweetened beverage industry that has been showing us how these corporations behave. The capture of science and uh, politics by these corporations has a single purpose, which is to block policies aimed at reducing consumption of these products, measures that are aimed at reducing their impacts to health measures and policies that have been worldwide recommended even by the World Health Organization in order to reduce the costs that arise in public health and also the costs to uh, the public regarding the health risks arising from these products. This book shows this capture in the case of junk food corporations and sugar sweetened beverages, which are the main cause of the epidemics of obesity and diabetes that the world is currently undergoing and is one of the most serious epidemics that the country is suffering, which are also aggravated by the pandemic since it, these are some of the main comorbidities associated to deaths uh, due to COVID-19. The global burden of diseases, which is an international think space rec recognized by the WHO that estimates the impact and the main causes of death and disease in the world, estimates that in Mexico, 40,000 people die every year due to the consumption of sugar sweetened beverages, due to its contribution to deaths arising from diabetes and cardiovascular disease mostly. Globally, the leading mortality cause is uh, considered to be uh, poor nutrition. Among the 10 main causes of mortality, uh, well, 10 of them are related to poor nutrition. Every hour, on average, 23 people die in our country due to diseases arising from obesity. The Pan American Health Organization and WHO have very clearly stated how in Latin America, to, well, the higher the consumption of ultra-processed foods, the higher the body mass index that is overweight uh, and obesity. This is uh, to provide a dimension or to give us the context behind this book in terms of the capture of uh, the academia, in terms of how 
they have tried to block the efforts to reduce these impacts. Why have ministers of health done nothing? Why did they pay no heed to the recommendations by PAHO and the WHO? Why did they act even against these recommendations as the book proves? Why do professional healthcare associations remain mostly silent regarding this process in Mexico that led to us having some of the most serious indexes of overweight and obesity, as well as the most serious cases of deaths related to diabetes. Why did academic institutions, with a few exceptions, not raise their voice? Why even diabetes associations were in the side of, uh, of beverage companies against taxes when these sugar sweetened beverages represent 70% of the sugar, of added sugar intake in uh, the Mexican diet. An editorial of the Journal of Public Health years ago was dedicated to pointing out that the vectors, that is to say, uh, the way in which non-communicable diseases are suffered without the main cause of, uh, of obesity and death are the large corporations. It is the same that Dr. Marta De Chang uh, stated when she was the head of the World Health Organization in the sense that in the past, diseases were born by mosquitoes and now they are born by corporations. She said that unlike mosquitoes, corporations have lobbyists and large sums of money. However, for these corporate epidemics to take place, the collaboration and uh, the and also the complicity of members of academia, science, and politics uh, is ne is necessary. And this is uh, recounted in this book with a great context inter internationally of uh, how we got to this point. I'll give the floor to the authors now. Marta Elena Garcia and Guillermo Bermudez. They are both uh, journalists and also science communicators graduated from the National Autonomous University of Mexico. They are authors of the books uh, Alimentos Sustentables a la Carta or uh, Sustainable Food a la Carte, um, Mexico, Mexico DFL, Desaster que Viene, Mexico, The Coming Disaster, and Our Daily Taco. They have co-edited several issues of La Jornada del Campo, such as those dedicated to the second international meeting of peasant economics and agroecology in America. They have participated in, in various activities with social organizations of producers, consumers, academics, and researchers from different universities, as well as with cooks and specialists in traditional cuisine. In addition to presenting in different forums and developing outreach projects and teaching the course workshop, cultivating and cooking health with sustainable food. Since 2010, they have been working in a community garden with low-income women in a town in the municipality of Calimaya in the state of Mexico, where they planned mainly for self-consumption and to produce inputs for the production of handmade products. They are members of the Mexican Society for the Popularization of Science and Technology, where they have collaborated in several projects, such as the online course, Introduction to the Public Communication of Science. Martha and Guillermo, could you please turn on your cameras and microphones? The floor is yours for you to present the book. Thank you very much. And a good morning. Before anything else, Guillermo and I would like to thank Fernanda, Victor, and especially Alejandro for making possible what today can convince us. We are very glad to discuss with you a subject that we believe is essential and urgent in the citizens' agenda. This book responds to the commitment that we acquired many years ago in our journey as journalists and science communicators to make public health one of the essential interests in the food. That's why we are in alignment with the goals of El Poder de Consumidor in order to carry out this uh, work of uh, investigative journalists without any interference with our liberty of expression and communication. That's why we have no conflicts of interest to declare. During the pandemic, the reality has uh, 
showed us, very importantly, why health care must be a key issue on the public agenda, and most importantly, one that is free of conflicts of interest. We do understand that the conflict of interest take place when health stops being the priority interest, and there are other interests that um, are overlaid, in, especially economic interests. In the world, experiences have accumulated regarding the role that the food companies play in the decisions of uh, public health policies, as well as on the scientific evidence that um, sustain them. That's why it's so urgent and relevant to discuss conflicts of interest in the field of scientific institutions, academic institutions, and professional institutions, as well as their connection with said policies. In 2015, in the United States, and soon after in Europe, a scandal took place when Coca-Cola, forced by public pressure, informed about the lists of healthcare professionals, scientists, professional societies, and research centers that it had that it had supported in recent years. They were all discredited because theoretically they should be recommending to avoid sugar sweetened beverages. This also in Mexico it was made known which universities and professional associations received support from beverage companies, whereas elsewhere that was a reason for shaming that didn't ha that didn't happen here as if it was normal. That should not continue to happen. If recently what was normal was to accept the support of food and beverage company uh, companies, it was known that with one hand these uh, beverage companies were sponsoring activities from 95 healthcare organizations with the other, they were lobbying against the taxes for soft drinks. And this should be giving rise to outrage as well as a public debate to discuss conflicts of interest in this field because in the end, this has an impact on public policies as well as in university training of professionals as well as in the orientation that they provide regarding nutrition. Regarding nutrition. In Mexico, conflicts of interest have taken place re regarding, uh, regarding uh, this type of uh, companies in different scenarios at the government level, at the highest levels, of course, as well as also uh, with uh, non-governmental organizations and uh, research centers. One of our goals was to investigate which conflict of interest stories have taken place in Mexico regarding uh, food uh, health and which have been some of its protagonists. However, the conflict of interest is a matter that, despite its importance and broad repercussions in national life, this has not yet made any impact in the academic and scientific communities. That's why we consider it is important to discuss this publicly as it happens in other countries in the field of health. There is a game between those that must uh, defend it for their commitment to human well-being as well as their obligation to protect society and those that damage it through the sale of its products, putting their economic interests ahead. When uh, the former allow economic interests to prevail, then we start getting into the field of conflicts of interest. And these murky games have taken place for more than half a century thanks to the tobacco industry that developed a sort of playbook or a general strategy to which all industries which products damage uh, human health have been ha have stuck to and food and beverage companies are not the exception. The purposes of this strategy are to create a favorable environment to their products while discrediting scientific evidence on their damaging effects and highlighting their supposed benefits, both to persuade the public to continue to buy their products as well as to delay, minimize, and eliminate public policies that are intended to regulate them. Within the playbook, science and its institutions play a very important role. We begin by asking, well, is science always science, whoever is doing it? Even if this uh, if it's research financed by industry or their companies, financing of scientific research can give rise to bias. Are uh, scientists that receive the financial support from these companies still independent? Isn't science the infallible way towards the truth? 
isn't it the only antidote to ignorance? Are, uh, is research uh, financed by the industry offering alternative explanation of obesity and diabetes valid? All science uh, uh, faster than Mexico in later decades has uh, been seeking to solve issues in terms of uh, nutrition. Why are, are, are they actually looking for solutions to the problems of diabetes and obesity in Mexico? Should we see with good eyes the scientific awards that are organized by industry? The effects of company financing become uh, distortions to research from the way in which research questions are asked as well as the interpretation of results. Financing can cause uh, researchers to give a favorable turn to results that can be interpreted in different ways while omitting or minimizing effects and uh, not, not publishing them. Investigations that are paid by the industry have higher probabilities of reaching favorable conclusions regarding the consumption of their products or results that minimize risks to health as opposed to those carried out independently. From the 80s, the financing effects were discovered. If it was known who paid for a study, its results could be predicted. For example, a study carried out in the United States with more than 200,000 physicians between 2013 and 2015 showed that those invited by the pharmaceutical industry to just one $20 lunch were prescribing to a great extent a drug that was promoted. If they received, it, received a more costly um, invitation, they increased the prescriptions even more. It is a path that has been transited by pharmaceutical companies a lot. However, it's becoming very difficult to uh, walk that road in the food and beverage industry. They want to deceive us, however, with, with uh, supposed uh, scientific evidence. It is regrettable that in the case of higher education institutions, there are universities that seem to be an arm of the food industry instead of an independent voice in the debates on nutrition and health. We should reflect on the role, especially when it is the case of public universities that are bound by duty to serve the nation. Given the poor conditions in which academic and scientific work are being condu conduced, what is the risk for universities to accept industry financing without conditions to protect their independence? We must ask ourselves, is it ethically correct that Nestle has contributed to defining the educational companies of the first nutrition uh, undergraduate programs in Mexico? Is it normal that uh, public edu uh, universities in Mexico have allowed and even uh, sponsored the penetration of uh, company interests instead of being accountable to society that supports them. Can we continue to candidly think that higher education institutions can create educational bonds with manufacturers of uh, junk food without um, further consequences? Uh, regarding the well, professional societies, what would you think about a pneumologist uh, association that receives money from the tobacco industry to organize its activities? Well, it, uh, apparently the interests of both sides are not aligned, right? In the same sense, it would be worthwhile asking, would you put yourselves in the hands of a, neutral, of a nutritionist that uh, is part of a professional organization that is supported by Danone or Nestle? Or if you had diabetes, would you um, see with good eyes that they are members of a professional organization that receives money from Coca-Cola. Of course, there are um, um, well-meaning members of these professional associations that are receiving money from corporate sources, but with all, would, would all this situation inspire trust? After decades of an industry that has uh, fostered that has fostered the use of uh, breast milk substitutes. Have, they, have this been truly beneficial for society? Is it correct that a society that it, that, a, that societies that teach it, that, that that bring together nutritionists 
receive uh, money from food and beverage corporations in, um, with a prominent presence of these companies within uh, these events. The same questions could be asked from other professional associations financed by the industry, which should recommend avoiding the consumptions the consumption of food and beverages with an excess of sugar, salt, or um, artificial sweeteners in the case of children. And what could be said from organizations such as the Aspen Institute, Movisa, uh, Hablemos Claro, or the Mexican Institute for Competitiveness, or Queremos Mexicanos Activos, or the International Institute for Life Sciences, among others. All of them appear to represent civil society and to focus on social and scientific activities that are legitimate, but in reality, they are responding to commercial interests, uh, becoming uh, also pressure groups themselves. These facade groups have gained an increased presence and influence in the training spaces for healthcare professionals, financing research, conferences, uh, granting scholarships, and a long list of other activities. They also participate in discussion forums representing civil society and industry. So how ethical can, the, can be the opposition to the establishment of uh, policies? that prevent the consumption of junk food when they come from an NGO that is receiving uh, financing from beverage companies. Behind the mask of philanthropy that companies wear hides a marketing strategy to advance financial objectives. And at the same time, not paying taxes, for example. The social responsibility goals of uh, promoting health and protecting the environment, aren't this a greenwashing intended to divert attention from the serious damages to human health, to environmental health and social health caused by the consumption of their products. Something similar could be said from um, foundations such as uh, Fond Salud or the Nestlé Fund for Nutrition or the Coca-Cola Beverage In Institute. And they trying to position themselves as the great benefactors of humanity by fostering investigation in health or when in the end this is not just more than marketing. When we find out that the industry is financing uh, research, conferences and scholarships prevents us from having further elements to make better decisions. Hiding information is another way in which ignorance is manufactured. It is evident that the conflict of interest is a complex matter and that it touches very sensitive fibers. It is not always easy to judge a, situ uh, a specific situation because the boundaries between what is ethically allowable and what is not are very diffuse. We know that debating this matter will enable researchers, academics, and healthcare professionals, as well as their organizations alongside the citizenry, to stop looking at conflicts of interest as something that is normal, inevitable, and irrelevant, or even worse, justifiable. In this sense, the uh, further progress has been made in the pharmaceutical industry, which is very careful because it is uh, way ahead in the sense of conflicts of interest. There is a lot that could be learned and taken to the food and beverage industry that is just taking baby steps. Of course, not all scientists or healthcare professionals and civil associations are corrupt. However, it would be uh, important to start initiatives to reduce the financing they receive from industry as a first measure to reduce conflicts of interest, you, as well as making companies more transparent in the resources they provide. That is why it is urgent to speak honestly about this matter. Undoubtedly, many would say, Without that support, then how could I investigate? How could uh, conferences take place? Others might uh, answer that in the field of uh, food health, sponsors that are less questionable could be sought. Taking a step further, it is possible to prevent the conflicts of interest arising from the people that should be looking for health and the people that um, work in the corporations which products produce chronic diseases. In this time when um, academic work has become uh, so um, underfunded, is it possible to set limits and establishing what should be, what could be done, what could be preve prevented and keeping a safe distance? 
what is acceptable or not in the financing of a conference, a scholarship, or an award by the industry. It is not possible that in agreement or contract, the total freedom of a researcher should be kept, or if they are prohibited from revealing who finances their work or their participation in a conference. Also, in uh, conferences, it should not be admitted that industry is um, proposing uh, speakers or roundtables or inundating the event with advertising. A set of measures should be put in place that uh, put at the forefront ethical principles, because uh, even though uh, making the source of uh, income more transparent, it has to be supplemented with other measures. In matters of investigation and the higher education, all the problems we have presented could be reduced if a public budget for education and science could be increased. Researchers that begin uh, or, that re or that receive these funds is because they need them. We should not forget that the tactics to seduce, deceive, disorient, and even buying scientific favors in, acad in academia also or by public officials and institutions are part of a general strategy that is led by larger food and uh, ultra processed food and beverage corporations. A strategy which purpose is to block, divert, minimize, and delay ad infinit infinitum if possible, all public policy that is aimed at reducing the consumption of their products, which has led to the obesity and diabetes epidemic that we are going through today. Strategy that once and for all is necessary, is necessary to speak of and dismount. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Marta and Guillermo. Truly, this presentation very clearly shows your level of collaboration as well as your commitment with this matter. I wouldn't want to add anything else. Let's go to the comments. First by Fernanda Hoppenheim. She is executive co-director of Poder since 2018. Under her leadership, Poder has become a member of the facilitating group of the Treaty Alliance, a founding member of the Feminist for Binding Treaty, part of the driving committee of the ESCR Net Corporate Accountability Working Group, and an advisor uh, to its corporate capture project. Prior to her work, to her work at Poder, she was a consultant to several national and international organizations and led the Where is the Money for Women's Rights program at the Association for Women's Rights and Development. She has worked on human rights matters as well as social and gender justice issues for two decades. She has been a presenter and facilitator at the UN Forum on Business and Human Rights and the regional consultations on business and human rights in Latin America, among other venues. She was part of the planning committee for the People's Forum on Business and Human Rights in the Philippines in 2018. She was selected by more than 100 members of the SCR Net to be part of its board of directors and was appointed as its president in 2019. She is part of the faculty of the Simone de Beauvoir Leadership Institute in Mexico. Thank you very much, Fernanda. The floor is yours. Thank you, Alejandro, and good morning to all. I, I appreciate this opportunity to discuss uh, this important book. I would like to begin by commending uh, Martin Guillermo for uh, great work, this great effort of uh, documenting such a well, uh, an issue that is uh, very difficult to actually point out and prove. It sets a very important precedent for debate. First of all, I would like to discuss this from my experience also working in this international project on corporate capture and emphasizing, of course, that what we are looking at here, and there could be different uh, meanings for capture or conflict of interest, but it is a phenomenon widespread uh, globally. And this uh, phenomenon, phenomenon has taken place in, non, in all industries and all uh, aspects of uh, life and economy. And capture is defined as a process of interference 
of co-opting spaces in public life or public interest spaces in favor of private interests. And this capture, in general, is exercised by economic elites in our countries. It manifests itself in different ways. Precisely this project that Alejandro discussed is an international project that tries to define and document the phenomenon of, of uh, corporate capture. And there are different manifestations of it, of course. There are eight of them, uh, some of which are perfectly stated, described, and, ex and explained in this book. We're explicitly discussing the capture of academia and also the capture or interference of, um, well, within science as well as the capture of narratives. I believe this is essential and Marta and Guillermo are documenting it very well with numerous examples of how through this financing and uh, through this interference as well as this penetration on academic and scientific spaces, it well, narratives are also being captured in terms of what is healthy, what is not, as well as which are the root causes of this phenomena of um, overweight and obesity and health problems arising from these uh, situations. These narratives explain that this is due to the multidimensional uh, situation, trying to minimize the responsibility of industries with this phenomenon. Also, I think it is very important to emphasize how, from corporations, narratives are being captured. We see this in other phenomena, for example, when we discuss the energy transition and the climate crisis, and how alter alternative science is being created by these industries. I believe this is an essential uh, contribution made by the book. The book is clearly giving examples in concrete cases of how this phenomenon takes place, how these corporations act in the food industry and the ultra-processed food industry as well, and how this translates to academies, science, and also to public policy decisions. In the book, as I said, there are clear examples of the mechanisms that are being used for these capture processes. On one hand, it is the subject of a nourishing doubts and nour nourishing doubts uh, is what is being done, uh, creating this parallel science that contradicts what has been researched uh, and documented. Corporations do this through the creation of their own centers or their own research initiatives, but also by financing highly recognized uh, research centers. So financing science at Academy, of course, uh, reduces their autonomy. The authors discuss inocul the concept of inoculating uh, research centers, and I think it's an excellent analogy. What independence could be had if, uh, the comp if these organizations be, depend on this financing. It is also important to discuss the precariousness that currently exists in academia for many researchers, because I think this is not a minor issue. This penetration of capital, of private capital, in scientific and academic institutions as well as institutions as well as uh, um, academia is not an isolated matter. Uh, that arises from that is also the product of a lack of uh, of financing and the withdrawal of the state as uh, an authority that is responsible from regulating this and investing on science, education, and technology, which creates a void that companies uh, fill with their financing and capital. But of course, it is very difficult for somebody that is receiving funds for for institutions, individuals, or a team of individuals that are carrying out research to maintain their autonomy. And it is not because there are bad intentions, but because they depend from this financing. It is very difficult to bite the hand that feeds you, basically. So it is a very perverse strategy by corporations creating this dependence from research centers as well as research teams and um, academia. Another example or another tactic that they, that Martin Guillermo described very well in the book has to do with this interference in regulation. 
and that this is done from different mechanisms and tactics. Corporate lobbying, of course, is very strong in these companies. For example, we have seen with all the work that has been done by El Poder del Consumidor and their networks of allies with the front of package labeling and how companies have interfered by lobbying, but also by using delaying tactics. And this is what has been documented by the authors to deny, uh, divert, and, um, del and minimize in this uh, playbook of corporate tactics. And of course, creating this alternative evidence or even a discourse that is even more subtle saying, for example, that evidence is insufficient. So here it is also necessary to shield processes in the development of public policy and the implementing thereof, as well as in the creation of new laws and regulations to prevent corporate interference. Also, in the book, it is very clearly explained what is the penetration of these organizations in uh, professional associations by sponsorship or through the revolving door phenomenon. How uh, That is how it is defined in different spaces. People that are on one side or the other of the playing field spend some time in, the, in academia, some time in the private sector, even the public sector, and they go to the private sector and vice versa. And this revolving door is not only create this, uh, create a flow of, of strategic information from one side or to the other of the playing field, but it also gives rise to conflicts of interest that are very serious. I also believe that it is very interesting how in the book it is documented and studied what happens with civil organizations, what happens in terms of the creation or the financing of civil organizations that also seem to back the creation of this alternative science or the, cre or the discourse of insufficient evidence, as well as the importance of industries and uh, the risk we would incur if we regulate them, because this would imply a reduction in investment, a reduction in the job creation and so on. So in order to conclude my comments, I would like to highlight first what are my thoughts, many of which are captured in this book. And I reiterated, this book has very clearly documented this phenomenon that is so difficult to point to, to document and to reflect on. In my experience, when we discuss capture, uh, we are always asked, what is the evidence? What are the concrete cases? And this book contributes very importantly in this regard. There are five elements I believe are necessary in order to uh, continue to fight this phenomenon of the capture of industry in the healthcare sector. First of all, transparency. But as Marta said, transparency by itself is insufficient. Of course, making the resources that finance research is very important making transparent what are the what is the investment made by companies on corporate social responsibility, philanthropy, as well as research and development. That is essential and it's a very clear phenomenon. However, it is not enough by itself. Of course, regulating conflicts of interest is extremely important. And not only for public officials, we have a few instruments at this time, and not only related to individual uh, conflict as the authors uh, highlight, we require clear policies to regulate conflicts of interest at institutional level as well that uh, go also to regulate public officials. We also need to discuss precariousness in academia, as I said before, and as well as the resources that are needed for research and development in science in our country. For example, through international cooperation, instead of opening the door to corporations for them to penetrate into these spaces with their capital. Also, we should transcend the discourse that liquidity exists in the private sector, that there are no public funds or funds of multilateral spaces or international cooperation that are sufficient, and that we can only uh, rely, um, rely on this type of, um, of financing or funding coming from um, private organizations. We should also discuss uh, international matters, and here the experience in the tobacco industry is very helpful. 
there. It was achieved in the framework convention to control tobacco to include a very clear clauses in terms of conflict of interest and to have the tobacco companies leave the negotiating room. The same is being uh, attempted in the framework of the COPS for the climate crisis. There is a full campaign to take large uh, polluting companies from the negotiating room. I believe that there we have very clear examples of where we could uh, go to internationally in these specific industries. And of course, and uh, that is the essential contribution made by this journalistic uh, work by Marco and Guillermo in the sense that we need an informed citizenry. We need to discuss these matters, put them in the public agenda and understand that this phenomenon is not harmless, is not innocent, but that it is uh, truly orchestrated and that there, that there are corporate uh, strategies and tactics behind it. I would close with that. And I thank Marta and Guillermo for their hard work, as well as to El Poder del Consumidor for their support to make this happen, as well as the commitment with continuing to opening doors uh, to all of us in order to access this information, understand this phenomena, and uh, collectively think on how to fight them. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Fernanda. I believe that this global vision is very clear by those that are working in these international spaces to look at the behavior of these large corporations. This is very clear in terms of how this capture of science intends to create a narrative that removes responsibility away, that shifts responsibility away from its products. We will close with the comment by Mr. Manuel Toledo. Manuel Toledo, for, for many of us, he is a teacher in, um, in environmental matters. Listen listening to him and reading his work has been a very important uh, has been very important for our training he's an academic and biologist with a phd in science from the national autonomous university of mexico he has published more than 200 research and dissemination works including 12 books and more than 40 scientific articles he is a frequent contributor to the newspaper la jornada he has been awarded many different awards, the National Environmental Award in 85, the Ecological Merit Award in 1999, the Luis Elizondo Award by the Monterey Institute of Technology in the two, year 2000. But his most important contributions are in the field of ethnology, which are contributions that have been world recognized worldwide, as well as his very important contribution to the discipline of political ecology. He is one of the better known uh, authors in this uh, field. Throughout his more than 30 years of academic work, he has developed an extraordinary research work in teaching and the training in the field of environmental thought, linking uh, ecological science with society and in the interdisciplinary interpretation of rural and indigenous societies. He carried out the most important documentation regarding the productive, sustainable experiences in um, rural and, and indigenous societies. In May 2019, he was appointed Minister of Environment and Natural Resources, a position he held until August 31st, 2020. And uh, he is inviting us through his social media to a very important course in political ecology, thinking towards the future. What should we be thinking in this uh, crisis of civilization that we're undergoing both environmentally and in terms of health and within this model in which corporations have become the dominant economic powers in the planet and that in many ways this economic power becomes political power. Thank you very much, Victor, for joining us today. We hear you. Your microphone is turned off, Victor.
appreciate it. And what, what could I say? We welcome this book by Martelena and Guillermo, with whom we have in one way or another we collaborated in, in different ways. I know their work and their prior books, as well as their publishing work at La Jornada del Campo. What, what else could I say? Um, the book arrives at a very timely moment. You will see why. In terms of um, political timing, we are precisely at a time where in this final stage where of how corporate uh, power is consolidating. And from my knowledge, this book uh, appears in the same line of other books we had seen before. In 2014, the book by Giancarlo Delgado on water was published and the entire subject of water in Mexico, how it has, how it has been um, hoarded in a way by the companies themselves, Coca-Cola, Pepsi, Nestle. This uh, book was published in 2014. Then came the book by Elena Alvarez Buya and Alma Piñero regarding uh, genetically modified uh, organisms, where it uh, is in opposed with the book by Francisco Bolivar Zapata, which is precisely a dissertation and here it is very clear because this is, dissertation appears to be scientific in defense of uh, genetically modified organisms, having the backing of uh, UNAM and the Mexican Academy of Science, as well as El Colegio Nacional, and so on, which should be considered. And precisely two weeks ago, a book published by Itaca appeared, a process to transgenic foods I, uh, published by Julio Muñoz, a 500-page book that um, turns this issue in itself again in a critical way regarding uh, genetically modified organisms with extraordinary chapters by Julio Muñoz, where he clearly analyzes the narrative by Francisco Bolivar Zapata, uh, completely dismounting it to prove that it is uh, full of fallacies. And finally, the book that we are reviewing today, but that indeed, as has been said by Alejandro and Fernanda, I believe this book takes a step ahead. It is a step ahead because it goes uh, to directly analyzing the strategies, the corporate art and science against the regulation, and it offers all sorts of examples. It is interesting that it begins by revealing an epidemic, the epidemic of obesity and overweight that is connected with these uh, diseases and that was also revealed by the COVID-19 epidemic. I believe this is an excellent starting point. However, all the research work that has been carried out by Marta and Guillermo in depth, including uh, interviews to many actors and uh, well, stakeholders in this uh, controversy. Following what Fernanda has uh, discussed, what happens is that we are witnessing the age of corporate capital globally. We're living the age of full commodization, and even we might say the totalitarian commodification of a social life and life itself, of the environment, of biodiversity, and so on. We're witnessing the apex of corporate capitalism. 
and corporate capitalism is showing the higher concentration, the highest concentration of wealth, the highest levels of uh, of monopolization in all the fields, in almost all fields, and this, of course in the defense of life and in the defense of justice, in the defense of human dignity, situates us in a total war. This is what the world is living today. And its two main impacts are the enormous social inequality, which is uh, the highest that has ever, ever taken place in humanity and the highest economic crisis uh, rep represented by climate change. The book we are reviewing is part of this all-out war between corporate capitalism and the defense of life, social life and life itself. And of course, in this war, corporations induce corruption and indeed this leads to the corruption of science. I'm also invited to review this book precisely at a time when, uh, after two books, uh, two, two articles written by myself were published at La Jornada regarding the corruption of science in Mexico. It is also very interesting that this book fully discusses the issue of conflicts of interest, which is prevalent. Now then, the axis of this book is healthcare, but indeed, the issue of healthcare is connected to nutrition, to food, to water, to economic and environmental matters. And what Marta and Guillermo are exploring in depth falls within all these categories. On our side, we have discussed the entire, well, all environmental matters and how corporations are using scientists to, um, to do a greenwashing of their image. This is highly documented. We have also documented this in Mexico uh, from many books and articles. But in terms of food, there is the important criticism to the agro-industrial model and the agro-business model where all large corporations that produce uh, seeds and um, agrochemicals and the pesticides in general, agricultural machinery, and of course, biotechnology regarding genetically modified organisms. It is very important to highlight that the book also appears in Mexico during a change in regime, a change in regime, and this means the book must arrive to the highest spheres of Mexican government, and this must be made available to decision makers at the higher levels, because healthcare matters need to be responded to by a by a state policy. The book um, reviews it, and I have to discuss the presence of Hisama, which is an intersecretarial group that is led by Semarnat two years ago, in which the Ministry of Agriculture, the Ministry of Health, gonna sit. Ministry of Economics and the Ministry of Culture participate. And it is important to push forward so that Hisamak manages to convince the president of Mexico to have in place an integrated state policy regarding health, including, of course, all these elements. The book and its first uh, two or three chapters takes the example of Coca-Cola. And, well, indeed, Coca-Cola is the flagship of corruption and uh, marketing manipulation. Just, 
last uh, night, what I watched while I was preparing these remarks was that now Coca-Cola says that its products clean the blood. And now the main uh, ad by Coca-Cola states that all its products are healthy. I wrote an article in July 2020 when I was Minister of the Environment that was uh, called Coca-Cola in the Blood, highlighting this movie that, that got uh, very deeply to our sentiments and that everybody should watch, reminding us how Coca-Cola also uh, greenwashes its image, not only in terms of um, health and nutrition, for example, it sponsored a book on climate change, which authors are none other than Mario Molina, Jose Sarucan, and Julia Carabias. This is a very clear example of, indeed, how in this case Coca-Cola whitewashes it uh, or greenwashes its image, seducing key stakeholders in uh, environmental science. This is very clear for us as well. Usually in Mexico, scientists or the most renowned and awarded scientists are all cooperating with companies, all of them without exception. There is no time to go in great detail on this. In this war, where indeed industries and corporations seek not only to create their own corporate science, but also co-opting public science, science in universities and government organizations. I believe that this arises, or actually it is facilitated by the ideology of uh, scientism, which is something that I wrote about today at La Jor in La Jornada. This idea that is treated with, that is treated very broadly by the authors in its book, this idea that science is neutral, something that is pure and immaculate, as, as if uh, science did not exist for many perverse uh, purposes. For example, 15 corporations that are working for the production of armament with hundreds and thousands of um, scientists and engineers building sophisticated weapons. This is also science, plastics, agrotoxins, and pesticides, as well as GMOs. I would like to finish by saying that in their excellent revi revision uh, and well, review of these matters, the authors indeed highlight four goals, four perverse uh, goals in the justification of um, quote-unquote uh, scientific truths, which are to deny, deflect, um, deviate. And I would also add discrediting Today, we know that globally, companies that focus on the dirty work of espionage, of politicians, or individuals that are against um, corporate capital, this happened to me also, and it has happened to many of us, as well as to Alejandro Calvillo. Espionage of personal life to discredit scientists is taking place, scientists that oppose, that oppose these matters. I would like to finish by saying that this book, this book must be widely disseminated. We need more books that do research uh, of this sort. I'm sure that Martin Guillermo will be preparing those, but also to announce 
that with a set of colleagues from UNAM, we will indeed try to create an important forum to put scientific research up for debate. You are all invited to join efforts because we need to make this public, to broadly disseminate this all-out war between corporations and scientific research in this case, which is being seduced in well at all levels. Here, the neoliberal atmosphere that has prevailed in our countries is very important, and it has made somewhat glamorous to be an, a businessman or a politician, but, and also being a, a businessman scientist, a business person scientist, which could be one of the most serious conflicts of interest that today exists for Mexican scientists. So we need to reveal all of this. And uh, that is why not only do I applaud the publication of this book by El Poder del Consumidor, but also, but also um, propose that we disseminate it broadly and continue to present it. Congratulations, Martelena and Guillermo, for your work, for the amazing work you have carried out. And thank you very much for inviting me for these remarks. Thank you. There are concepts that you mentioned and that resonate strongly and that I believe explain reality. Sometimes it is necessary to find new ways to name reality in order to understand it. And when you are discussing about the totalitarian commodification, I believe it's something that we're witnessing in all levels. And yes, we are at the highest levels of wealth accumulation and monopolization. And uh, well, let us go to the Q&A session for our authors and uh, guests, speakers. You can um, send us questions through Facebook as um, well as through the Zoom chat box. You would like to hear now these questions. And for that, I would ask the authors and our the commenters to turn on their cameras in order to provide answers. One of the questions read, well, I'm going to read one first and then we will let Betsy do this. Kenya Velasquez asks, Fernanda, what is the way to make industries be more transparent, transparent with donations and funding to scientific research and whether there is any international experience or law in this regard? This author could also be answered by our speakers if we know there are ways to face this. Fernanda? Well, yes, thank you for the question, and indeed, there are different ways to regulate standards of transparency for companies, including this. Something that has been importantly debated in the past 10 years is that progress has been made in the standards for financial information disclosure by companies in terms of their operations. but. Not enough, enough progress has been made in transparency or disclosure standards which fall in the category of uh, philanthropy or social responsibility or uh, in initiatives to support um, environmental matters. It is there where instruments exist. For example, the guiding principles of the United Nations for companies and human rights, which are the ones are most I'm most familiar with, require or somehow foster and promote that transparency standards exist, standards that are as high as those that regulate the disclosure of financial and tax information by companies, by corporations of, from any industry. I believe that there the key is to go 
from voluntary information that is voluntarily disclosed to what is required. And uh, the regulatory frameworks should be strengthened as well as transparency. Well, but for the time being, we are moving in the field of what is still voluntary. Well, yes, what I would add, and I do not know if uh, Victor, Marta, and Guillermo would like to add anything. Important scientific journals that are highly regarded throughout the world, most of them require the, to require information regarding who funded research. In some cases, research publication has been denied in case of uh, obvious conflicts of interest. It is possible that if a uh, research is paid by a large uh, publishing company, then there shouldn't that would be a conflict of interest. The same happens with these uh, corporations when conflicts of interest uh, overlap and are so clear. I wanted to find out whether inf whether questions have been asked. Yes, Alejandro, and good morning. We will begin. I'm going to take some of the questions we have received during the Zoom session by Elizabeth Saldana. She asks, which organizations or healthcare organizations do you recommend should be followed in order to look at research or any actions that go again that, that are independent of uh, the trade interests you have mentioned? I'm going to ask a second question and then open it up to the panel. David Trujillo from Ecuador, that is also joining us in the Zoom uh, room asks, what do you think about the actions of ethics or bioethics committee or the review by journals before the publication of this uh, of this research that is being funded by corporations? We could begin with this and then continue with other questions. Well, I could just uh, start discussing the first question. In the field of nutrition and health, the reference in our country, an institution that lacks conflicts of interest, is the National Public Health Institute that for a long time has been operating in sort of eliminating conflicts of interest. When well, Dr. Rivera was head of the Latin American Society of Nutrition, he set forth alongside a group of experts from this society guiding principles to prevent conflicts of interest. We attended a conference by the pri by this organization before Dr. Rivera became the head of it. And what Guillermo said, exactly what happened, Guillermo Bermudez, it was like a fair, like a trade fair of Coca-Cola and Nestle products, and products from all these type of companies. And obviously, what this meant for the Latin American Society of Nutrition, a big effort. A digital uh, conference will take place in terms of how to do this without these resources. And they have managed to do it. It's the second large conference by the Latin American Society of Nutrition where this type of support is not accepted because it might represent a conflict of interest. And where evidently, uh, when uh, funds are provided for these conferences, which in the past took place in tourist destinations, perhaps, with, uh, where there were sea and beaches and so on. They uh, set forth that other fora and other speakers had to be put there by the industry. I do not know if Fernanda, Marta, and or Guillermo would like to say anything. Well, yes, regarding the ethics committees from scientific journals, it would be worthwhile to state initially that it is very important that in all publications that are serious, there are review processes. Regarding the taxing of soft drinks, that is a paradigm case. Because the research that was carried out at the National Healthcare Institute was published at a journal 
that was peer reviewed. And so that gave it a very different level to that of other pieces of research that were conducted in order to question the effectiveness of the tax to soft drinks that were not published in any magazine because initially the committee did not accept an article of that sort with such obvious conflict of interest. However, it would be worthwhile highlighting that corporations are quite perverse and that even there are committees, committees from specialized journals that um, can be easily co-opted. So it is a very complicated matter following in the tracks of the situation. It is quite difficult, difficult to catch, so to speak. And it would be difficult to deal with these sort of ethics committees, the, which quality is so dubious. Go ahead, Victor, please. Yes, the issue of scientific journals. Well, in the case of transgenics, we've had very um, embarrassing situations, such as the case of an article by Dr. Chapella at the University of Berkeley in California, where he revealed the contamination of corn in Oaxaca by GMOs, and which was published in Nature magazine, if I am not mistaken, which is one of the two most prestigious journals in the world. And then afterwards, it was questioned. Uh, the article was challenged and uh, taken down. It was highly controversial. And uh, there, scientists supporting transgenics came into place. Another case was that of Dr. Celerini, with the rats that were given glyphosate and uh, uh, developed scientific, uh, well, cancerous tumors. There was important controversy, and um, discussion ensued in Europe for and against, and indeed, I do know that the main uh, medicine journal, which I believe is Lancet, the, pub the publisher has accepted that corruption problems have existed in editorial committees. So imagine the financial power of a corporation. They can do whatever they, they want. And well, that is my, my opinion regarding the journals. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Victor. Would any, would anybody care to participate in this uh, second round of question? If questions, if that is not the case, I will read the next questions. Julissa Chavira asks, "How can we uh, break this trend towards the um, commodification of the world when consumerism is fostered um, in po in the population so much?" Important question by Julissa and a second question by Ariadna Tovar Ramirez. Besides the regulation of interference in public policy, should there be regulations in terms of social corporate responsibility? Would anybody care to answer any of these questions? Please go ahead, Fernanda. Yes, I would like to address that of social corporate responsibility initially. I have comments for both, but initially I would like to begin with that. And indeed, it would be necessary to have some sort of regulation, but I also believe we are at a time, and it is important to say it, where there is a global trend to somehow transcend the discourse of social corporate responsibility and to stay on the narrative or the discourse and eventually with real positive impacts in terms of human rights and the environment. Of course, corporate social responsibility is located within the field of, of voluntary action. These are initiatives by the companies to, quote unquote, give something back to society or offer good faith actions to or community outreach where they operate. 
And this, from my perspective, is pretty much connected with self-regulation. The private sector, different industries during decades have worked saying we can self-regulate. We can limit our negative impact. We are conscious and we can regulate our own processes in order to prevent damages and so on. And we know that that does not work. Self-regulation does not work. So it is necessary to reinforce state mechanisms in order to regulate these industries. And this, from my perspective, includes these initiatives of corporate social responsibility in the sense that you can do any initiatives you want, just as you can pay an advertising agency to sell your products, but that must be regulated. And that does not um, excuse you from your obligations to respect human rights and not damaging the environment. That in, in, implies also uh, an obligation to respect the right to health and not to damage it. And that transcends so called corporate social responsibility and places us in the discussion of how to regulate in a binding manner the action of companies within these industries so that they do not damage the right to health, so that they don't damage the environment and not abuse human rights. I believe that indeed we need and that globally instruments are being developed in this regard. I believe that it is Mexico's turn to get up to speed with this global trend in the framework of how to, how to uh, shield human rights before the actions of companies and how to bind companies to do so, even though in the Constitution and in legal frameworks there are elements for this to happen, how can we reinforce them? Because in practice, these are not being abided by. So this would be my comments in terms of corporate social responsibility. I would like to draw from this how to break this commodification. And it is about having better regulations that are more stringent in the field of advertising on the communication of messages, especially those that are oriented to children and parents, or in terms of ultra-processed foods on one side and on the other. I believe it is essential to start unmasking this false philanthropy. For example, there are ads that state, now Coca-Cola is investing in giving water to the communities. But yes, the water that Coca-Cola has extracted from communities. So unmasking this perverse way of making us believe that they are truly investing in our health or in the environment and so on. And um, something that is also very important that Victor mentioned and that we address somehow in the book is the role of Hisamak. Yeah, yes, we definitely need to put pressure upon the current administration so that they move in a faster and more efficient way to, to start uh, furthering the regulation of junk foods because that matter is, uh, has, has really grown stagnant. We've moved forward, but so far we do not know what is happening with the campaign to educate the consumers so that they know, for example, what this front labeling is truly about. But at the same time, it is necessary to regulate advertising aimed at children. In the past, companies uh, pretended to self-regulate, and Rocio Rodriguez, who we remember dearly, who is no longer with us, said that this code that companies imposed to self-regulate, well, people thought it was ineffective. And she said, yes, it does work. It does work to show that it does not work. And of course, that's the case. And what happens with the tax, with the tax to soft drinks? Somehow it got stagnated and uh, it was not possible to achieve the goals that were initially proposed. Please go ahead, Victor. Yes, thank you. Just 
adding to what was just said, the issue of environmental and social responsibility is indeed connected with the respect of human rights and the rights of nature, which would be these two sets of rights. And of course, corporations today are the main culprits in the violation of both sets of rights. What is needed in Mexico, indeed, is a state policy, a state policy that can take health care as, um, as a pillar and then branching outwards to all other uh, matters, including education. And our role is essentially to inform, to provide knowledge, to educate. And I loved the Martha's concept of unmasking, indeed, unmasking all this flood, all this storm of face information that on a daily basis we're being bombarded with. Every day we're being anesthetized. Citizens are being anesthetized and are being given a completely wrong image of reality. So the role of journalists, of critical journalists and um, conscious researchers, the role of true public officials that are against neoliberalism is to unmask and most importantly to provide young people with elements for them to have a critical attitude towards life. Please go ahead, Alejandro. Yes, I believe that everything we have been reflecting on today must be within the context of what is happening globally. The moment that humanity is uh, going through, we are facing one of the most serious environmental crises, and uh, we're facing a massive deterioration of nutrition globally with the penetration of these corporations. So we must think about this crisis, a crisis that won't be overcome with small reforms. In the case of advertising, what has happened is that they have promoted a way of life, American hyperconsumption that has become widespread, but the same, as I said, the same that is promoted as a lifestyle in a community in Nepal is being advertised in the Mixteca mountain range of Oaxaca with the same products, the same model of life and the same model of consumption. And that is not sustainable. That model of consumption is not sustainable. The entire population aspiring to the same things. And I take this from Victor, this anesthesia of the citizenry through advertising. Advertising by itself, is something that should not exist, especially as an art of persuasion. Advertising of products seems to be amazing sometimes, how creative these publicists are, but they are persuading in a deceitful way the consumer. What ad, ads should be is that this should be regulated to only tell the truth about products. This car provides these conditions and this specification that would have to be proven. But in that regard, what advertising could Coca-Cola give? It could not advertise. Because Coca-Cola's advertising is that it will make you happy with an injection of sugar that will lead to a discharge of dopamine. And it will, of course, provide you with energy, but then it will provide you, it will give you diabetes and affect your immune system. In this sense that radical change is needed, I believe that advertising would have to change radically. If you'll allow me to add a very quick comment in this sense of how to fight consumerism or how to challenge this model, I think it is also very important to recognize and to provide much more visibility to what we could learn from the grassroots social movements that are living and are thinking and putting in practice different ways of living. And then environmentalist movements, indigenous movements, Afro and feminist movements. In those, there is a lot we could draw from. 
because it would seem that there is just one way of living, and it, that is not um, promoted just through advertising. It is also through social media, through influencers, and so on, that are receiving corporate money and that are trying to sell us into um, believing that there is just one way of life and one way of being happy. And making alternatives visible is very important. So I'm always uh, told, you are against this, but what are you in favor of? That's a question I'm always asked. It is important for us to ask that as well. What other ways should we make visible, which will, of course, help us to um, overcome this crisis? Thank you very much, Fernanda. And those that have participated in this question round. A question by Maribel Coronel, who asks, who would you consider are the obstacles that have prevented millionaires and other companies that have been taxed with the special tax for parts and services? Uh, what has prevented from these taxes being collected, these taxes collected from being used for healthcare matters? I would like to answer Maribel. The current situation, and Maribel knows it, is that a, prax a practice of not labeling resources or, or of not uh, earmarking funds for specific purposes. I remember certain meetings at the Ministry of Finance where they said, uh, what will happen to us is what happens in California, because their most, uh, most uh, taxes are earmarked for specific purposes. And let's say that an emergency happens and we won't have funds to respond to them because everything is earmarked. And that is what the Minister of Finance has said, but we need to reverse it. The healthcare sector is overcome before the pandemic. Dialysis required by hundreds of thousands of patients in Mexico was no longer being covered by the healthcare system. It was said that the resources from the popular insurance would be necessary for that, making it devoid of resources. So the point is that that we need to earmark funds. Uh, the, the moment that these are earmarked and transparent, the population will support it. If we hike the tax to 10 or 20 per percent to sugar sweetened beverages, which was the original proposal, was something that was left uh, halfway due to the company's influence. But then afterwards, this tax was adopted in the United Kingdom, Portugal, uh, India, and so on. Mexico was the first country to apply the tax, which could imply a reduction in consumption but the, recourse, the resources have not been uh, given to the communities. And we saw it in the surveys. 70% of Mexicans would support taxes if these are transparent and if these go to vulnerable communities or if they go to healthcare. That is a great opportunity that has not yet been taken advantage of. Uh, tobacco is uh, giving rise to 70,000 deaths a year. That's due to alcohol and alcohol damages. It shows that there is no single policy, for example, uh, for alcohol. And we must remember that ministers of health came from companies that were involved in the alcohol trade in our country and that had connections with the president of the republic and all politicians. So those are other stories that would have to be t told regarding these revolving doors. So there is a lot to do in the case of these trade determinants of health, which I would say are the uh, trade determinants of disease. They should be charged the taxes, and all these taxes to junk food, uh, cigarettes, and um, alcohol would need to be earmarked to fund prevention and healthcare policies because what Peña Nieto said, President Peña Nieto, was that, well, there are these existing programs, but those programs existed even before the tax. So the taxes apparently were being used for the same projects that already existed and that already had assigned funding. Thank you very much, Alejandro. I will the following questions are 
connected with regulation and uh, legislation for Mexico. Lisbeth Diaz Trejo is uh, asking, which mechanisms in the Mexican state do you, con do you consider are the most important to strengthen in order to protect human rights above uh, economic interest? The next question is whether any legislation exists to prohibit funding to conferences or travel expenses or the purchase of cell phones, tablets, and so on to healthcare professionals by the pharmaceutical industry and uh, breast milk substitutes. And a final question from this round is regulation by the state should is in the is is operating under corporate capitalism and which would be the way to prevent health effects by the consumption of this type of products that damage uh, health would anybody care to um respond well i could i would like to offer some comments I believe that there are many mechanisms from the state that could be strengthened or a new regulation that could be developed. I will mention just a few examples, but really, I believe this is quite broad. In Mexico, good legislation exists in terms of human rights, broadly speaking. However, implementation tends to be quite problematic and insufficient. I believe it is key to strengthen the justice system, its independence, as well as the possibilities to guarantee the right to justice and remedies when human rights uh, abuses take place. This uh, should somehow exemplify or show that impunity will not be, will not, uh, be allowed. Because if there are no consequences, it doesn't matter uh, how, what laws we have in place. So formalizing the healthcare system is very important, as well as the implementation of regulation. I believe it is also essential to develop public policies in terms of uh, human rights and corporations. Some efforts have been made. There's a st still a long way to go. And as Dr. Toledo said, it is necessary to have in place a state policy. I also believe that it is important to discuss trade agreements. Today, trade agreements have clauses in place that basically make the states to relinquish their sovereignty for the protection of rights vis-a-vis -vis investment. So mechanisms such as the well, private uh, courts or um, conflict resolution mechanisms from invest investment countries, for investor countries. In that case, uh, states lose their sovereignty in the protection of the citizenry while negotiating with uh, investors due to these clauses. So internationally, there is also the need to develop frameworks that could later be applied nationally with different conventions, frameworks, or treaties that are binding that could provide us with more tools to stop corporate um, abuse. If we are situated within the situation of a corporate capture by economic entities, of course, regulation is insufficient because if these processes or these officials have been captured or if there is undue influence, they won't do their work. The question would be, why are they not doing their, their job? Why is the state ineffective when regulating even if they have good tools in certain cases? So what we require there is to Create, is to strengthen collective power from the citizenry to demand accountability, to oversee, and to demand that there are better regulations and that their implementation does take place. And so, us as consumers, and stop providing fuel to these companies. Thank you, Fernanda. Please go ahead, Martin and Guillermo. I believe within uh, all this that the Fernandez is mentioning to restrict as it is done with public officials that need to make their funding their income transparent all of that already exists there's regulation in this regard 
and it is almost non-existent in the field of research and those that are that are working on health care research and nutrition there it would be essential to have in place a full code that sets forth perfectly to what extent could it be possible to receive funds and always make resources transparent that should be applied immediately. Precisely this aspect of conflicts of interest will allow us that there are already regulations in this regard that Lucero Rodriguez was telling us about all the efforts that have been carried out to regulate conflicts of interest in this field. However, I believe it is now the time to fully regulate it. Right. There are even universities that have in place ethics committees and guidelines in terms of how to deal with conflicts of interest. At UNAM, this exists. However, I believe they, these are still lax and that no independent mechanisms exist to verify that these are truly complied with and under which terms. Because as we said in our presentation, perhaps you could be forced to accept the aid in, uh, in a certain way, but under which conditions? To what extent can you yield without harming your own credibility or without going against ethics? Or without you getting, uh, without people getting their hands dirty, in short. Thank you very much, Victor or Alejandro. Would you like to add anything? No, all right. Okay. Well, I think this is the final question, right, Betsy? Right, uh, Alex. Well, perhaps just one more round of final remarks by everybody. And before uh, you take the floor, I would like to thank you so much and to commend uh, Martin Guillermo for this work that I believe is a historic document. Whomever would like to study in the future the epidemics of obesity and diabetes and understanding why actions were not taken, why ministers of health created organ organizations alongside industry and that came from other organizations that were paid for by industry, people that used the revolving doors from the in going from the tobacco industry to the public sector, understanding all this uh, uh, conflicts of interest and so on, we'll have to read Martin Guillermo's book and hopefully this will make decision makers think and become important information for civil society that could be helpful for us to continue putting pressure to prevent this from happening again. So thanks to Fernando and Victor and I'll give them the floor, please. Victor, we could begin with you. Well, yes, I would just like to say that after everything we have said and what we have been discussing together, I believe that this book indeed contributes with information and knowledge, with debate, to reduce the dose of anesthesia, which we are constantly a prey of. And bringing down this anesthesia will allow citizens, human beings, and families to be made uh, aware of the social and environmental, environmental matters and uh, for them to adopt, as Alejandro said, other lifestyles. Because there's the world of regulation and the role of the state and advertising and so on. And a different thing is what we do as human beings. So other lifestyles that could go against all these impositions that are placed upon us and which will allow for this empowerment of citizens, social empowerment, which uh, from my perspective is the only thing that has the potential of transforming the world. And thank you again for inviting me. Thank you very much, Victor. Now, Fernanda. Well, this reading was very interesting F for a long time. Well, I hadn't read a publication of this sort so quickly. 
I think is, this, is, this is a substantial contribution. Congratulations. And I am thankful for having been part of this event and this rich conversation, and that hopefully in the future we can continue to weave ideas and alternatives. Thank you very much, Fernanda. And you are highlighting an aspect we have not brought up, which is uh, the pros and the style of Marta and Guillermo that make reading quite enjoyable. Marta and Guillermo, your turn. That, right. Uh, first of all, thank you. Sharing this space with you has been um, great. And uh, I'm left thinking that if this book is somehow contributing that new generations consider what has happened historically in our country so that that does not happen again, that for me would be the high satisfaction. And in terms of anesthesia, I would like to mention that a way to wake up from this zombification of society or this inoculation of mercantile ideology will have to be outrage. I think that none of us like to be lied to or to be given a discourse that this is science or that scientific evidence does not exist when it is just about blocking public policy. I believe that this indignation must be collective because I believe we are all fed up with being lied to with so many fake news and that now and for us to now discover that fake science also exists, please, there must be consequences. There must be major consequences after the citizens are empowered so that we can um, have an effect on public policy and that this to have an effect on science matters. And for us to stop considering people of science as people that are beyond reproach and that not even the most, uh, well, not even the biggest funding could affect their their objectivity. We need to look at the sources of this scientific information and dig deeper, because if we are left with the version we just get from uh, instant messages, then we were done for. And industry cannot continue to play this role of being the benefactors of humankind when indeed they are continuing to make us sick with their products. And besides that, they want to deceive us telling us that their products are ham harmless and that they pose no environmental uh, threat and that these are also beneficial for society. So, well, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, Marta, Guillermo, Fernanda, and Victor. And thanks to the audience that has followed us through different platforms. This will be recorded and uploaded to social media in case you wanted to share it afterwards with other people that could not join us today. Thank you very much.